It's my pleasure this morning uh, to introduce Michael Song. Michael is one of our key educators in the uh, GME program here at Virginia Mason, and Michael trained at Northwestern. I, if you looked at the weather in Northwestern, Michael, it's a little bit cold right now. Um, after he went to Northwestern for medical school, though, he came to um, University of Washington, where he did his internship and residency, and then he was chief resident, and I think he came directly from there to Virginia Mason and has been one of the great additions in my career at Virginia Mason. He's a great educator, and he uh, is involved with the residency program, as I said, and they, sent, they do weekly didactics, and this was one that came across my desk that I saw and immediately called Michael up and asked if he'd do for Grand Rounds, and I think you'll see the reason why, but go ahead, Michael. I appreciate your being here today. Great. Thanks so much, Bruce. I appreciate you asking me to do this. It's a real pleasure, a real honor. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. And just for the listeners, I'll be jumping back and forth between a PowerPoint and um, my web browser because we'll, a lot of what we'll do is go through um, some of these online decision aids and I'll just show you how I use them in real life. So um, I think it's most useful. So we'll, today we'll talk about practical use of decision aids, online decision aids and shared decision making. I think it's most useful if we start off with a patient in mind. So let me, oh, if I can get this to go, go, good. So this is a 55 year old man with a total cholesterol of 220, HDL 40, triglycerides of 150 and LDL 150. He's African American, he has no significant past medical history, no family history of vascular disease or smoking. His blood pressure is 130 over 75 and his 10 year risk of heart attack or stroke is 7.5%, which is right on the borderline at which um, a statin medication is commonly recommended for heart disease risk reduction by the American Heart Association guidelines. And so the question is, what is the most appropriate next step? Is it A, recommend a statin, B, refer him to a nutritionist, C, recommend 30 minutes of exercise five days a week, D, recheck his lipids in three months, or E, engage in a shared decision-making process. And so part of the point of this is there's often um, multiple different um, appropriate options. And this is, a, uh, this is when um, you know, the situation is ripe for shared decision-making. So today we'll talk a little bit, I'll give a little bit of background about shared decision-making in general um, and, um, um, and decision, decision aids in general. Uh, but most of the time we'll spend is actually going through some of the, my favorite decision aids that I use in real practice. Most of these are from either the Mayo Clinic, which has an entire institute devoted to uh, patient-centered care and shared decision-making. Um, and then another website called healthdecision.org, which was started by a preventive cardiologist over at University of Wisconsin, uh, who originally started with cardiovascular risk decision aids and then has since branched out to other decision aids. And I'll show you a couple others that I like as well. Um, before we do that, we'll talk just briefly about shared decision making in general. And you know, the best way to think about what is shared decision making is to talk about the different steps of shared decision making. And so there's three key elements to shared decision making. Uh, the first one is choice, that we should be clear that a decision is required, which um, sounds like a no brainer, but in real practice, it's, it's very easy to overlook. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a room with a patient and I think I'm doing a great job going through different treatment options and kind of the risks and benefits of all the different options. And I get to the end of this long spiel and I say, well, what do you think we should do? And the person is surprised, um, you know, or, or, or they wake up, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and part of the problem is, you know, for better or worse, it's common for people to come in to see the provider and expect to be told what to do and expect to listen passively. Uh, and it turns out we listen differently when we know we're going to be asked to make a decision. It's kind of like we, we learn material differently if we know we're going to be tested on it. And so it's super important when there is a decision to be made to, to make it clear that you're going to be asking your patient to make this decision that, gosh, you know, we have some options here. You have some options here. Um, there's no one right answer. Um, and so I'm going to give you some information about the different options. In the end, I'd really like you to, you know, help choose, you know, which path you take, uh, you know, and, I, and I'll, I'll give you help. But, but this is really your choice. Um, so I, I can't emphasize this one enough that it, even though it's a, it's a real simple idea, uh, it's something that's easily skipped. Um, the second part is options, is to go through the best available evidence uh, regarding the risks and benefits of each option, which is something we might commonly do anyway. And the third part is making the decision. And in an ideal world, the decision would be made uh, based on the patient's values and preferences with our guidance. So this shared decision making doesn't just mean, here's a menu of options, you know, you order. 
A shared decision means it's a shared process, it's a collaborative process that let's talk it over, let's see what things are important to you, um, and let's help you make the, the, the best decision for you based on your personal preferences. And so that's shared decision making in a nutshell. So why should we use shared decision making? Well, there's a lot of data on this um, that it may improve well-being through getting the right treatment for, the, uh, for individual people, um, better adherence to treatments, giving people fewer concerns about their illness, and overall better satisfaction with their health outcomes. Um, it's what people want. The majority of patients express a wish to actively participate in treatment decisions, and so uh, it, it's the right thing to do from that standpoint. And I would say just from a medical ethical standpoint, it's the right thing to do. It supports all of our major medical ethical principles. A few other comments about um, shared decision making, um, and I bring up this concept of enumeracy, which was actually a book that we were assigned to read in medical school, and we learned that enumeracy is like illiteracy, but with numbers, and uh, part of the, some of the concepts of this is that there are variable interpretations of verbal qualifiers. So we often use things like low risk statements, like low risk, moderate risk, high risk. But, um, you know, there have been studies that show that people view risk differently. A lot of times when healthcare providers say something is high risk, maybe they mean there's a 10% chance that it happens. Whereas a patient's um, perception may be that it has to be a 50% chance for it to be high risk. And so um, uh, different people will have different interpretations of verbal qualifiers. And so um, numbers may be a better option. The trouble with numbers is um, people aren't always great with numbers. And so in one study, 22% of people weren't able to identify which was highest risk between 1 in 10, 1 in 100, or 1 in 1,000. So we'll commonly use these phrases, um, and many people won't understand what they mean. 20% um, of college-educated adults couldn't identify which is highest, 1%, 5%, 10%. And many health professionals, you know, you know, we're people too. And so we also um, often lack facility or confidence with some of these numbers. And so with that in mind, um, there have been some expert re recommendations regarding shared decision-making and how we communicate um, risk and how we communicate numbers. Uh, one recommendation is that we present information using absolute risk, you know, the absolute numbers rel rather than relative numbers. Um, risks uh, are generally um, seem to be inflated when we use relative uh, risk as opposed to absolute risk, and I'll show you examples of um, absolute risk later. Um, and med medical treatments are often viewed more favorably when we describe them as using relative risks. So this treatment will lower your chance of having a heart attack by 30% is um, much viewed much more favorably than saying that um, uh, that it'll reduce it by, you know, it'll take take your risk from 10% down to 8%, which is a 2% drop. And so the absolute, the relative numbers sound a lot, uh, a lot larger than the absolute numbers. Um, uh, other recommendations that we should highlight incremental risks distinctly from baseline risks and, uh, and the decision aids I'm showing you today will, will do that and I'll show you an example of that. Um, and the last one, which is why I love some of these online decision aids, is that we should use pictographs. We should use pictures. It, it allows patients to better comprehend risk regardless of their numeracy. And so um, uh, it's, a, it, it's a lot easier to look at a picture than listen to a bunch of numbers, basically. Um, so that's shared decision making. That's the background I want to give about shared decision making. So what's a decision aid? Um, and not surprisingly, a decision aid is a tool to aid in shared decision making. And so it can come in a variety of formats. Um, and it should basically, you know, it should include all of the components of shared decision making. What's the decision that we're trying to make? What are the different options? What are the risks and benefits and uncertainties? And ideally some help for people to think through their values and preferences, some, some way to help them make their decision. <clears throat> And there's good data on decision aids as well. It improves knowledge, patient knowledge and patient clarity regarding their own values, uh, patient involvement, improves communication, all really good things. And on the topic of the patient I brought up, uh, which is a cardiovascular risk question, um, uh, there's actually good data that using that giving people their cardiovascular risk information improves their accuracy of their risk perception. It actually seems to increase statin use in moderate to high risk patients if they know that they're at moderate to high risk, if they can see that. Um, and it seem, it may even reduce predicted cardiovascular risk over time. In other words, when you show somebody their um, cardiovascular risk, um, their blood pressure tends to get better, their cholesterol gets better, they're, um, you know, may, they're more likely to quit smoking, et cetera. Um, so there's, there's pretty good data to support using these things. So the first decision aid I'll start with is kind of the first one I ever learned about. Um, so an oldie but a goodie. And this is the Mayo, uh, one of the Mayo decision aids. So I'm going to switch sharing over to my um, web browser now. And um, 
you know, there's links for these things, but if you just remember kind of what they're called, it's pretty easy to find. So I literally just go to Google, uh, to Google and I will type in Mayo Statin Decision Aid, which you can see I've done before. And it's the first hit here, which is the Statin Choice Decision Aid. And it opens a window that looks like this. And Michael, so, I think you didn't, uh, you didn't switch oh, over. Sorry about that. Let me double click uh, on that. There you go. Can you see this now? Good. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. So yeah, I literally just typed in Mayo Statin Decision Aid, and this is where I got to. And I'll I'll literally bring this up uh, in, in front of a patient in the room while we're talking about the cholesterol, and I'll say, let's get started. And you know, and I tell people, you know, um, you know, cholesterol isn't just about cholesterol. There's you know, it, 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 we we don't care about cholesterol just because of the number. We care about cholesterol because it influences your chance of having a heart attack or a stroke. And um, we can actually you know, calculate your risk for heart attack or stroke. And then there are some treatments that we can talk about um, that might reduce that risk. And I, I'd like to, you know, if it's all right, I'd like to go through that with you to help you see if that's something you'd like to do, if, this, if, if it's something that would make sense for you. There are pluses and minuses of this. And so um, I've already taken the liberty of filling in this risk calculator, uh, but I'll tell you, you know, we can actually fill in your information and get a personalized risk for you. And this will show you that over the next 10 years with your situation, if we took 100 people just like you, um, eight of them would have a heart attack and 92 of them would not have a heart attack. Now we have these medications called statin medications, which um, lower cholesterol, but more importantly, lower heart disease risk. And if we put you on just a standard dose of a cholesterol medication, this is what would happen. So these 92 people that we're gonna be fine are fine anyway. And six of these people are still gonna have a heart attack, but um, putting these all these people on a medication, we would save two of these people from having a heart attack over the next 10 years. You know, what are your thoughts on that? And a lot of times people say, oh, that sounds okay. But you know, I've heard, I've heard things about these medicines, like what's the downside? And, and I could say, well, I'm glad you asked that. If I hit, on, hit, hit this next button, issues, these things will slide to the side. And here's a little bit more information about the treatment we're talking about. It's relatively inexpensive. It's one pill a day. It reduces both heart attack and stroke risk. Um, but what you're asking about is what are, the, what are the side effects? And so occasionally any medication can cause GI side effects like nausea, diarrhea, constipation, but it's rare that people actually have to stop the medication for this. The most common side effect that people hear about is muscle aches or stiffness. Um, this happens maybe in about five out of 100 patients. Um, although most of those patients don't actually end up needing to stop the medicine because of it. Um, and it's rare for this to actually cause muscle damage. That's about one in 20,000 patients. So to put this perspective, if we took 100 people and put them all on a cholesterol medication, we'd have five people who had some muscle aches that would go away if you stopped the medication, um, but we'd prevent two heart attacks um, over, the, uh, over those 10 years. Um, and so those are the main things that you're weighing here. And so people say, oh, that sounds okay. You know, um, you know, can I think about it, doc? I'm gonna say, you know, you should definitely think about it. And if you'd like, I can click on this button here and I can send you a copy through email or I can print out a copy and you can take it home and, and let me know what you think. Um, and so super useful tool, I think. Um, people like this, um, people like looking at home. It can help with documentation if you want. There's even a section where you can click on document and it says, I've used the decision aid, blah, blah, blah. Their risk is this and you can copy and paste this directly into your note. So a lot of nice, helpful tidbits. Um, and you know, this takes about as long as it would have taken for me to go through their cholesterol without the decision aid, but I think that the picture format makes it a lot easier to go through this. Uh, I think it makes it a more effective discussion. So let me switch back to my PowerPoint real quick here, and I'll okay, this time I'll actually double click on it. And I think we got it. So somebody yell out if I don't have it. Um, and then um, the, you know, the healthdecision.org also has a decision aid for statins, which I won't go through because it's similar. But when we talk about osteoporosis, um, both Mayo and Health Decision um, have decision aids on osteoporosis as well. And that time I'll show you the Health Decision one so you can see what those look like as well. Um, here's some other lipid scenarios and I'll show you um, another decision aid that I use frequently that many of you probably already use and I'll show you how I use this. Let's say we have a 52 year old man with a total cholesterol of 170, HDL 50, LDL 90, which you know is pretty great. Uh, he's Caucasian, he smokes half a pack a day. He's got hypertension on two medications but often forgets to take his pills. His blood pressure is 160 over 90. And so for someone like this, I might choose to use a different decision aid and I'll go back to, there we go. And so for this one, I might use 
um, the ASCVD risk calculator, so the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So if you just type in ASCVD and hit, uh, into Google, it's the first non-sponsored link. Um, it's the one from the American College of Cardiology, so this ASCVD risk estimator. And it looks like this, and I pull this up. I pull at least some risk calculator almost every time I talk to somebody about cholesterol because that's really the, the you know, the, the key point isn't just their cholesterol, it's what their risk is. And I've already plugged this gentleman's information in here. And, and the conversation I have is, you know, this shows you that your chance of having a heart attack or a stroke over the next 10 years is around 12 out of 100, which means there's an 88 out of 100 chance you won't have a heart attack or a stroke. A couple of things I want to point out, um, you know, if you had perfect blood pressure and perfect cholesterol and didn't smoke, your, your risk level would be much lower, about 2.6%. So your, your risk of having a heart attack or stroke is over four times greater than, your, um, you know, than ideal for your age. Um, uh, but the good news is there are things you could do about it. So I want to show you a couple of options um, and uh, get, get your opinion on what you think would make the most sense for you. So for instance, we could work together to try to get your blood pressure to a better level. And let's say instead of 160, we got your blood pressure down to 130. And your risk would drop from 12 out of 100 down to closer to 8 out of 100, which is pretty good. Um, or if we didn't do anything with your blood pressure and you decided, uh, you know, and we could work together for you to quit smoking, that would, that would drop it even further. You would go from 12 out of 100 down to 6, six out of 100, which is a pretty impressive. Or if you did neither of those things, and you know, even though your cholesterol is very good, we know there's good studies that show if we put you on a cholesterol medicine, even if you have low cholesterol, it would knock about a third off of this risk. So it would drop from 12% down to about 8%. And if we did more than one of those things, if, if we got your blood pressure under control and you quit smoking, gosh, your risk would be almost ideal. And so there's a lot of different things you can do to lower your heart disease risk. Um, you know, which of those things sound the most feasible to you? Um, and so um, I think this is a useful tool. This one's a little bit easier to toggle kind of the different numbers and show people the effects of different actions on their, on their outcomes. So I really like that in that way. Um, and then I'll go back to the slideshow really quick just to show you another case, which is a 50, 50 year old Asian American woman. Her total cholesterol is 220, HDL is 40, LDL is 160. Her blood pressure is 120 over 80. She smokes a pack a day. And if we go back to that same risk calculator, I'll use this in a slightly different way now. And, you know, basically I'll show, show her that, you know, gosh, over the next 10 years, it looks like your risk of having a heart attack or stroke is around five out of 100, which, you know, in absolute terms, isn't super high. Um, you know, usually we think about using cholesterol medications when people's risk are higher than this, like seven or 10% um, per over 10 years. But the one thing I really wanna point out is that, gosh, if your blood pressure and cholesterol were perfect and you didn't smoke, your the the optimal risk at your age is about 0.8 percent. So your your risk is greater than is more more than five times higher than optimal for your age. And so that worries me. You know, even though um, the guidelines might not recommend a cholesterol medication or doing anything else differently, um, I would certainly consider a cholesterol medication, which would knock some some of the, some of this risk down. Um, or even more importantly, the biggest thing in your in your situation that raises your risk is the smoking. Um, and so I'll just show you what would happen if we if you quit smoking. Gosh, your risk would drop to almost ideal for your age. Um, you know, so how does that strike you? And so I think you can see that um, something like this might be a very effective tool for patients to really see kind of what their risk is, understand their risk, and kind of the different interventions uh, they can do to help that. Uh, so I think that's all I wanted to say about um, cholesterol. Let's switch over to osteoporosis. So this is a 79-year-old Caucasian woman with a bone density T-score of her left femoral neck of negative 1.7, which falls in the osteopenia range. Um, there's her height and weight. She has no family or personal history of fragility fractures, no smoking. She drinks one glass of alcohol per evening. And if you calculate her 10-year risk of hip fracture using the FRAX calculator, which our radiology colleagues have really, really nicely and helpfully um, included in all of their bone density reports, which I super appreciate because um, now it's calculated for us, um, it shows that her 10-year risk of hip fracture is about around 3.4%, and her 10-year risk of major osteoporotic fractures is about 13%. Um, and I'll just point out that the um, 2013 National Osteoporosis Foundation guidelines on treatment of osteoporosis, which many people still follow, suggest treatment for osteoporosis if you've had a fracture in the past, if you have a low T-score in the osteoporosis range, or if you have osteopenia 
at the femoral neck and a 10 year chance of hip fracture of greater than 3% or a 10 year probability of major osteoporotic fracture of greater than 20%. So these are very specific cutoffs. Um, the cutoffs are mostly based on a US specific cost effectiveness analysis. Um, but you can imagine that, you know, even with precise cutoffs that different people might have different values about how they decide whether or not to take a medication for this. Some people would want a higher level of risk before they started to take medication. Some people would want the medication at a lower level of risk. And so this is where a decision aid can be super helpful for this situation. And here's where I'll show you the healthdecision.org uh, version of the decision aid. And so we'll go back here to, and so again, to, um, to find this, if you can just remember health decision, and it can either be healthdecision.org or healthdecision.com, it'll get you to the same place and you'll get to the main website for them. And you gotta scroll down a little bit and it's under Tor Our Tools. They're actually marketed as being integrated with EHR, but you can use those tools, the same tools um, on, on the website uh, for free, at least currently. And it shows you all the decision aids they have. And we'll go through many of these during this talk, but I'll show you the osteoporosis one currently. Um, and again, I've already got it opened up here with this person's information clicked in so I can tell her, hey, you know, we can actually, put in your information and give you an idea of what your chance of having a broken bone is over the next 10 years or so. And I'll click continue. And these are the numbers. And, and I will say that most of the guidelines would recommend treatment for this, but let me show you a little bit, uh, some pictures to, to demonstrate this and, and get your opinion on it. And so I want, I'm showing you this because I want you to think about whether this makes sense for you. So over the next 10 years, if we don't do anything differently, all these women in red or yellow will have a broken bone. Three of them will have a hip fracture, which is pretty devastating. And 10 of them will have another major fracture, the wrist, the upper arm, or a spine fracture. So those are, those are not good things. Uh, I'll notice, I'll also point out that, um, you know, one of the side effects of the medication that we're going to talk about could be some GI side effects, but even without the medication, uh, uh, you know, a certain percentage of uh, women will have stomach upset, whether they're taking the medicine or not. So you can take that into account. And so let's say we chose one of the most commonly, like one of the oldest medications we use for osteoporosis called Alendronate or Fosamax. And this is what would happen. If we put all these women, all 100 of these women on Alendronate for a five-year period, uh, which is the typical treatment course, and then followed them for 10 years, um, all these circled women are the women whose fractures we prevented. So all these women were going to have fractures, but because of the medication, we prevent five of them from having a fracture, including preventing one hip fracture. Um, what are the downsides? You know, um, it does sometimes cause some, uh, some extra some stomach upset, and so that's shown here. Um, and you know, so there are some other rarer, rarer effects as well. And this is where people often interrupt me, or maybe they've already said something, said something earlier. You know, doc, I've heard about these bone medications, and I've heard that they can cause jaw problems, or I've heard that they can cause other kinds of fractures. And I say, you know, you're right. There are some rare risks taking these medications. Um, and to show you these risks, I can't show you these risks in 100 women because they're so rare. Let me switch this out to show you 1,000 women instead. And so this is 1,000 women all on the bone medication. And if we put them on the bone medication, all these women in red circles and yellow circles here, they have a fracture prevented. So that's about 50 women in this group. And about, you know, fewer than one out of a thousand will get a jaw problem from this and fewer than one out of a thousand will have an extra fracture caused by the medication. So uh, just to put that in context, it's a lot more likely that this medicine will prevent a fracture than it is to cause a problem. Um, and I should also say that most of these women would be fine either way, whether they took a medication or not. Um, but I don't know which of these women you'll be. And so, you know, whether you take the medication depends on whether you think this makes sense to you. And so that's often where I'll pause and we can have a discussion there. Um, and again, same as the other decision, people maybe aren't always ready to make a decision. In, I mean, I can't make a decision for the life of me. Um, and, you know, it takes me weeks to figure things out. And so um, um, I can say, you know what? You don't have to decide today. I can just print this information out. It's got all the information we just talked about and you can take it home and think about it and you know, send me a message through the portal in a few weeks and let me know what you decide. Um, and so people like that. And, and as, as similar to the Mayo Clinic, there's also a section where you can copy and paste um, um, something for your charting, which kind of reviews their risks and kind of reviews the discussion you had, which is um, really great and, and also a time saver. So that's the osteoporosis decision aid on healthdecision.org. And like I said, the Mayo Clinic also has a similar one, which I won't go through because it's similar enough. Um, 
I kind of slightly favor the health decision, uh, decision aid because they do show the harms on the same screen and the same pictogram as the benefits, whereas the male one lists the harms separately. Um, as you can see here, it listed in verbal, in written format rather than having a, a, a way to show it in pictorial format. Okay, let's switch gears to depression. So there's a 27 year old woman with six months of depression and anhedonia, no suicidality. She has insomnia related to this. Uh, she also has been having poor appetite, which is a problem because she's already thin at baseline. She's tried other measures and is now interested in starting an antidepressant. And she has no personal or family history of antidepressant use to guide us. Um, and so I'll point out that um, uh, the, uh, in terms of initial antidepressant selection, uh, the AHRQ uh, meta-analysis from 2011, which is what the decision is based on, um, uh, was clear that there are really no clinically relevant differences in effectiveness for the different treatments of depression. In other words, we have a bunch of different medications for depression, and they all work in roughly the same percentage of people. And so, um, Rather than choosing the medication based on which we think is most likely to work, which we don't really know, uh, we, we usually choose them on the basis of, of other effects other than how well they're likely to work. This meta-analysis has since been updated, but the data are, are, are still fairly similar. And so this is where I almost always, when starting a new antidepressant for a patient, I virtually always pull up the Mayo Depression Decision Aid in the room um, and go through this together. And so I'll show you the Decision Aid and I'll show you how it was studied at Mayo. And again, easiest way to find it, type in Mayo Depression Decision Aid. You can see that I've searched for this before. And this, the, the first non-scholarly article on this is the Depression Medication Choice Decision Aid, which looks like this. Let's get started. And it gives a little bit of background on antidepressants. And I can click next and I say, and I give that exact same spiel that they, um, they all work in equal, you know, same number of people. And so we choose on the basis of other characteristics. And I show them, uh, and this is how it was studied in the Mayo Clinic. They, uh, you know, it was basically recommended to say, look, you know, different medications can have different effects on weight, on sex, on sleep. Uh, what happens if you miss a dose? Um, the cost, by the way, just as a side note, the cost column is probably out of date. The, when, when the decision aid was developed, some of these um, antidepressants were much more expensive than others. Now they're virtually all generic, and so the cost is relatively similar. So I usually skip that one, or I tell them that the cost is no longer that different. And I say, you know, between weight and sex and sleep and what happens if you miss a pill, which of these um, do you think are the most important factors for choosing a medication? And she might say, well, you know, I've been having a lot of trouble sleeping. Um, you know, are there any of these going to make, you know, make my sleep worse or can any of these help my sleep? And I can say, I'm glad you asked that. You know, most of these are pretty sleep neutral other than the fact that treating depression can often help sleep. Um, but I will point out that there's one in particular that can sometimes make sleep worse. We probably want to avoid this one. And there's a couple in particular that actually seem to help with sleep, uh, one called mirtazapine and, and, and then an older class called amitriptyline and nortriptyline that we don't usually use as much anymore because of other side effects. Um, and so mirtazapine may be a good option. Uh, what else is important to you? And she might say, well, I'm concerned about my appetite. I'm losing weight. I can't afford to lose much more weight. And I can say, you know, different antidepressants have different effects on weight. As it turns out, mirtazapine might be a good choice for you because it also tends to encourage weight gain um, more than some of these other antidepressants. And again, some of these will actually cause weight loss. So we should affect, uh, um, you know, we should avoid those. Um, and so in doing this, you know, the, the Mayo studies showed that people, um, they felt better about their choice, they had greater satisfaction, and they, they, they may, it may have improved adherence over time to the treatment um, by using decision aid like this. And so, but um, if nothing else, even if I can't prove from a data standpoint that it improves outcomes, it makes it more helpful for me to remember the different effects of these things. For instance, maybe I don't remember um, that paroxetine and venlafaxine um, have, uh, are associated with really high rates of withdrawal that even skipping a dose or two can make people feel really poorly. And so I almost never use these two antidepressants anymore because of that withdrawal effect. Um, even if people don't report that as a high priority, I let them know that, you, gosh, you know, if you even miss a dose or two, you know, sometimes people feel pretty sick so that we may want to avoid these medications. And so um, even if you don't use it in the room with a patient, it's a, it's a nice reference um, to, to remind you of kind of the, some of the different effects of these medications. So that's the Mayo Depression Decision Aid. I love it. Um, let's go back to the, case, the um, PowerPoint and we'll go to the next topic.
Okay, so diabetes. So 67-year-old man with type 2 diabetes on maximum dose metformin. His last two A1Cs have both been a little bit high, 8.5%. He's been very adherent to a healthy lifestyle. He'd prefer, you know, and we, we talk about other medications, and he'd prefer a medication that's the simplest oral regimen, that's low cost and weight neutral at worst. And so, um, nicely enough, Mayo has also has a similar decision aid for um, diabetes. Um, so I'll go back to that. And I won't spend quite as much time on this since we've already talked about um, the um, uh, depression decision aid, but same thing, type in Mayo di diabetes decision aid, you'll end up here and goes through most of the major classes of medications, shows you the A1C lowering. What does the daily routine look like? Is it injectable? Is it a pill? Um, heart benefits, which you can also include here. They, these, these same classes also have kidney benefits, at least the liraglutide class and L SGLT2 inhibitors um, um, have both heart and kidney benefits. They have different effects on weight, different costs, of course. Um, different risks for hypoglycemia. So kind of walk through it the same way, which is kind of, uh, you know, there's a lot of different effects. Which of these are most important to you? And you can walk through that. Um, this is missing a couple of cl older classes of medications. Acarbos in particular is one that's really nice um, that is cheap and it's a pill and is associated with weight loss. So it fits a lot of people's criteria. It's not super effective at lowering A1C, but then again, none of these are super, super effective other than the insulin and, and a little bit of metformin and sulfonylureas. Uh, but that's another option that's not listed on here. And then some of the older, um, the like glutenized, like the repaglinide, which is a short acting um, kind of sulfonylurea-like medication, which causes insulin to be produced, aren't on here as well. So th th you do have to mention that you know, if there are things missing, um, you know, the, the decision aids are only as good as they are, um, but I will say it's still a super helpful kind of framework and tool um, that helps people kind of choose their next medication. So let's go back to the PowerPoint and we'll switch on to a different topic. Oh, atrial fibrillation. So this one, I just, I, this was a relatively newer one from Health Decision, and I was really excited when they have this because it is a really common situation. So it's an 86-year-old woman seen in clinic for new fatigue. She's found to be a new onset AFib. Um, you do an echocardiogram. She's got normal valves, normal ejection fraction. She does have moderate dementia with excellent mobility, a recent non-injury fall. She has no bleeding history. She has uh, reasonably well-controlled hypertension, no history of stroke or heart attacks or diabetes or liver or kidney disease, no alcohol. She's not on aspirin. Um, and, you know, you, you want to talk to her about anticoagulation and whether she would be a good candidate for that. So, um, both Mayo and Health Decision have this as well. I like the Health Decision one a little bit better. So I will show you that. <clears throat> and so again, if you go to the Health Decision homepage, um, one of the choices is the AFib one, and I've already included her information here. So what you can see here is that the left two columns are the CHADS VASC risk score. And so all of these calculators give people their baseline risk, which is super important. And then they try to give some, um, some uh, uh, measurement of kind of how effective different treatments are and what the harms might be. And here they use the has bled um, bleeding score. And, and if, you're, if you're not sure, you can click on the info button and you can see, well, why are they asking this question and it's because the, these are different components of the has bled score which can estimate the risk of bleeding and so I've already placed put her information in and it shows her in written format that her risk of stroke is five percent and that the national guidelines would recommend taking a blood thinner but I can show, show you this in pictorial form and over the next one year or five years or ten years this is your risk so usually I'll start with one year and um, you know, your chances of having a stroke, if we don't do anything differently, is about five out of 100 um, every year, which is pretty high, um, you know, as, as things go. If we waited five years, it would be even higher. But let's go back to one year. And we could pick one of these medications, a blood thinner, to reduce your risk for stroke. So, for instance, um, I often use a Pixaban, which uh, uh, has, uh, appears to have lower bleeding risk than some of the other blood thinners. And... Um, it reduces your stroke risk a lot. Of if, if all 100 of these women took the Pixaban, which is also called Eliquis, it would prevent four, you know, four of these five women from having a stroke or four out of the 100 total women from having a stroke. Now, the downside is it might cause extra bleeding, a major bleeding issue in one out of 100 women, but that's still much less uh, than the number of strokes that are prevented. And if we went out about five years, you could see, gosh, a lot more strokes prevented more bleeding, so you you know that is a downside, but um, but you know the, this helps put it in perspective. 
Um, and then you can talk to them about kind of what the treatment frequency is like, you know, what are their blood tests needed? For instance, warfarin, it shows you one pill a day, low cost, um, but you, you do need blood tests. Apixaban, two pills a day, high cost, um, but blood tests are less frequent, et cetera. Um, and again, don't forget that you can print this out for people and you can, um, oops, and you can, um, copy and paste this into your note, which is super helpful. It just saves time on documentation. So really like this one as well. Um, so let's go back to the slideshow here and let's switch gears. So the next few we'll talk about our cancer screening. And I purposely started with lung cancer screening because Medicare requires, actually requires that we have a shared decision-making conversation and requires that we document a shared decision-making conversation in order to, to order um, uh, you know, lung, uh, lung CTs for uh, lung cancer screening. So let's say, um, pretend you're a 70-year-old Alaska Native man in reasonable health and um, you're curr you, you currently smoke with a 50-pack year history. You have some college education, 70 inches tall, 200 pounds, no history of COPD or cancer, no family history of lung cancer. And the question is, what would you choose for yourself if you were in this person's position regarding CT screening for lung cancer? Would you choose annual CT screening until age 77 or 80? No CT screening? Or would you choose something in between, like a one-time screen, something like that? And so I looked uh, you know, I, I've looked for a lot of different decision aids. And by the way, I, if anybody knows of decision aids that I'm not showing you, to, I would love to hear about them. And I'll show you an example of one I heard about um, uh, at the end of the talk. Um, but, you know, the, when I typed in lung cancer screen decision aid, the first thing that came up was this website from the American Lung Association. Um, and it says lung cancer screen saves lives. No one deserves lung cancer. And so um, if you go through it, um, it's a little bit biased and it, it's basically just an eligibility tool. It just goes through and sees if people are eligible, but doesn't really go through kind of the risks and, and, and the downsides. So it doesn't really allow for that shared decision-making conversation. It doesn't have all the components of that. Um, I really like the health decision, um, lung cancer screen decision aid as well. And so I'll show you that one and I'll show you how I go through this. So again, if you go through to the healthdecision.org and tour our tools, um, you can click, you can select the lung cancer screen decision aid and um, it asks you a bunch of questions, which I've already filled in for this patient. And, you know, at first I was like, I, I wasn't clear on, well, why are we entering all this data? I don't remember this as part of the shared decision making conversation. Um, and so if you click on the info button again, um, it shows that this is to help us figure out their risk for lung, lung, uh, lung cancer. And it's based on a prediction model developed from the PLCO study. So if you're curious, that's why these questions are being asked. It helps get us a baseline risk for our patient. And once again, it shows you their risk and it shows the national guideline recommendations, in which case um, it says that you know CT would be appropriate. And I usually, for cancer screening, we usually need to flip it out to a thousand people. And I can tell them, you know, um, over the next, you know, if we followed you for six years and didn't do anything, um, you know, lung cancer would have occur in this number of people. So um, the people in red would die from lung cancer. Uh, the people in yellow would get lung cancer, but fortunately survive. Uh, the rest of them would be fine, but this chunk of people would get lung cancer um, and, and most of them would die. If we did the CT scanning, this is what would happen. These are the big outcomes. So first off, all these uh, men circled in red, uh, they have their life saved from lung cancer, which is great. So all these men don't die from lung cancer because we did the screening, which is, which is the big plus of lung cancer screening. Um, there are some downsides to be aware of. And so um, false alarms are pretty common. So you can see that all these men in light blue will have at least one false alarm. And some of them will have a false alarm to the point where they end up with an invasive procedure like a biopsy. So these men in dark blue have an invasive procedure and a couple of them will actually have major complications from it. So that's the downside. The other major downside is, um, is shown here. And the funny thing about um, testing, almost, almost any tests we have is that we end up finding more stuff that might not have affected you um, otherwise. In other words, if we do CT scans to look for lung cancer, we may actually find some extra cancers. These are things that look like cancer. We do a biopsy and look at it under a microscope and it looks like cancer to us. But in reality, if we hadn't gone looking for it in the first place, it wouldn't have affected your life at all. You wouldn't have known about it. You would have died from something else. And so um, 
um, sometimes the testing we do creates extra illness or extra disease. And so in this case, um, about 16 extra people will end up with a diagnosis of lung cancer that they wouldn't have needed otherwise if they hadn't gotten the scan. Um, and so, by the way, that concept of overdiagnosis, which is common, which is occurs with almost every test we do, but is particularly relevant in cancer screening, it's hard to, to discuss. And I kind of go back and forth about how to talk to people about it, but uh, it, it's usually not a one-line thing. I usually have to explain kind of the background of, of, of what that is. Um, but then I'll go back and say, so, you know, just to make, point out what we're wearing, lung cancer screening will save a lot of lives. It'll save all these people in red. Um, it'll lead to, you know, th this number of false alarms over here, including some extra procedures, and um, a certain number of people will be unnecessarily labeled as having lung cancer and maybe end up with a treatment that they didn't need, if they, they, that they wouldn't have needed if they hadn't gotten the CT scan. You know, so how does that strike you? And so somebody can respond to that. I say, well, that's great. Um, the other thing I'll point out is, you know, right now you're still smoking, and let's say we didn't do the scan, but instead uh, you, you, you quit smoking. Let me just show you what that would look like. And gosh, even more people, you, this, quitting smoking would actually prevent even more lung cancer deaths in your situation. So that would be super, super important, regardless of what you decide with the screening. Um, I would definitely recommend we talk more about the smoking. And if you did both, that would be even better. Look at all these lives um, saved um, by bo doing both the screening um, and, uh, and quitting smoking. Um, so tell me your thoughts on that. Um, and so uh, again, useful tool shows it in pictures, which is great. I don't have to, you know, mix people up with all these specific numbers. You can just look at it and see. Um, so I find this to be a super, super helpful tool, um, and particularly with cancer screen, which is a challenging topic. Okay, so that's lung cancer screen, breast cancer screen, also another very, very challenging topic. Most of the disagreement about lung, uh, about breast cancer screening. Um, is about you know, kind of the age in which to start and the frequency which, with which to start. So this is exactly the, the age group in which um, there's a little bit of difference uh, or there are differences between different guidelines. And so let's say you're a 54 year old healthy Latino woman. Your mom had breast cancer at age 65. You had prior mammograms showing breast density B with no prior biopsies or history of cancer. And so what would you choose if you were in her situation regarding screening mammography? Would you wanna do annual mammograms starting now every other year mammogram starting now, annual mammogram starting at age 50, every other year starting at age 50, mammogram only if symptoms develop or something else. And so very, very confusing, a lot of different um, um, choices for people. And so this is again, ripe for shared decision-making. Um, and again, I'll show you um, the tool in question. And again, I've already entered her information. And again, if you're curious, if you're curious where any of this data comes from, there's always an, there's almost always an info button where you can see, so like, what is this calculator over here? What are we using here? And it turns out this is the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium Risk Model, which includes, um, uh, and it's the version that includes breast density at helping estimate breast cancer risk. So it's not the only risk calculator, but it's a well-validated risk calculator and it includes factors like breast density. Um, and if you don't know the answer to some of these, you can also put unknown, you can still use the calculator. And I can hit continue and I can show her that, you know, gosh, your risk of having breast cancer in the next 10 years is a little bit higher than average. So I'm glad we're talking about this. And part of why we're talking about this is that there are a lot of different guidelines on breast cancer screening and they, they say different things. And so one group, one of the major groups in the US, the US Preventive Services Task Force, um, they recommend that most women get uh, mammograms certainly starting age 50, um, and but consider it starting at age 40. And so you're right in that window. American Cancer Society suggests starting at age 45 and doing them every year. Uh, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, so the OBGON groups, um, say the similar thing as this first group, which say certainly start at age 50 um, every year or two um, and consider starting at age 40. And so that's, wh again, where you're at. And the American College of Radiology says start at age 40 and do it every year. And so all, you know, all reasonable recommendations to, to, to consider. And so this is, you know, this is what breast cancer screening would look like for you. And so um, if we took a thousand women in your age and followed them for the next 10 years, um, this number of women would get breast cancer and the women in red would actually die from the breast cancer. Um, and so let's start with, if we started doing every other year mammograms starting now, this is what would happen. So the good news is we would save one of these women um, from dying from breast cancer. And, and I'll point out that, you know, on some people will say, look at this and say, it's only one out of a thousand, but we're taking, you know, this is actually pretty good in terms of cancer screening tests. We're taking a bunch of healthy people and, 
saving one out of a thousand from dying from cancer is a really big deal. And so that's a really huge benefit from the, um, the, from the um, uh, mammograms. Um, the downsides are listed here. Um, so most of these you know, in light blue are false alarms. And by false alarm, the most common false alarm is that you need an extra mammogram. Maybe they see something funny on the first mammogram and then you get a second mammogram. Often here, we usually do that second mammogram the same day. Um, and so it's usually not a huge deal, but it is an extra, extra test. Um, sometimes it's a little bit of a bigger deal, in which case um, you end up with a biopsy, an actual procedure where we take a, uh, you know, we put in a needle and take a sample to look for um, to cancer. And it turns out that the mammogram was wrong. There was no cancer. And so these are the main downsides. The other main downside I, I'll t I should tell you about is, is again, this funny um, thing that happens when we start testing is that uh, we will often find things that look like cancer that fool us into thinking you're, you're cancer, but that wouldn't have affected your lifespan if we ha uh, hadn't gone looking for it. And so um, the numbers on this vary, and there's some controversy about the exact amount, but something like for uh, every thousand women in your age that we that we test, we might you know, uh, uh, inadvertently create three extra breast cancer patients. In other words, we'd find three extra cancers that would have been fine if we hadn't gone looking for them. But because we did test, you end up with uh, an, an extra diagnosis of breast cancer. And so just to remind you of what we're weighing, doing mammograms starting now would, would save the life of this woman out of a thousand, which is actually pretty good for these screening tests. There are some false alarms as, as with any screening test. Most of them are relatively mostly just inconvenience. Um, there are some more serious potential effects. We might find extra cancers that, that we didn't need to find. Um, um, but again, um, we, we would save one out of a thousand lives. And so what are your thoughts on that? Um, and so I might pause there and I might show her, you know, if we did annual mammograms instead, this number, there's still only one circle here, but we actually save a little bit, a few more women by doing um, um, annual mammograms. It's uh, doing it every other year. We, we, we get about 80% of the benefit, 80 or 90% of the benefit of doing it every year. So there's actually a little bit more than one out of a thousand women that are saved. We do have more false alarms and a little bit more of these extra breast cancers. And so well, some women choose to do this every year. Some women choose to do this every other year. And I'll tell you that all the guidelines agree that we should probably start by age 50 doing something. And so the real question is, does this make sense for you to start now? Or would you prefer to wait until um, you're closer to 50? Um, and so I'll often pause there. And again, you can give people the information about it, uh, et cetera. And so let me go to the last one real quick. Oh, I should show there are a couple of other, you know, these, uh, I put these here that you can refer to later. If you Google Cornell mammogram decision aid, um, this one I, I, I like, and this is something that they could, can use at home. It's not as good in terms of the pictograms and the harms aren't as clearly laid out, but this is a nice decision aid for people to be able to walk through on their own at home. Whereas most of the ones, other ones I'm showing you um, are, are probably better when walked through with a, with a provider. Um, this is an example of a JAMA decision aid, but, uh, and it has a nice pictorial format, but it's not customizable to the patient. Um, and, um, and, and it's, you know, it's just, it's a flat image. Um, we'll do the last one real quick, which is prostate cancer screening, another super important topic. 55-year-old man here for preventive visit, few chronic stable medical issues, up to date on other cancer screening. And so you bring up prostate cancer screening in an ask, tell, ask fa fashion, meaning kind of have you heard, what, what have you heard about PSA testing for prostate cancer? And they say that they haven't heard much about it. Well, you know, if it's all right with you, I'd like to tell you about it. Um, uh, there's some um, differing recommendations about whether or not we should do this. And so um, uh, I'd like you to make a decision and I'd like to help you make a decision about whether it's right for you. And so one of the decision aids I use for this is actually from the US Preventive Service Task Force. And I'll just switch over. And so the way to find this, this one's a little bit harder to find, US Pre PSTF Prostate Cancer Screening. And if you go to their website here, you actually have to scroll down, you'll see that it's a grade C recommendation to do PSA screen. In other words, something that we should talk about and something we should have a shared decision making conversation about. And um, under media, there's a video that they can watch, but there's also this PDF file, which you if, and if you click on it, it gives you this table, this um, dem demographic here. And basically the way this conversation usually goes for me is that, you know, I wanna tell you about this test for prostate cancer. You know, prostate cancer is really common 
And um, the trouble with prostate cancer is that usually people don't have any symptoms early on. Usually by the time you have symptoms, it's already fairly, fairly advanced. And so uh, in an ideal world, we'd like to find it when it's earlier, when it's much easier to treat rather than waiting until it's too late. And so we have a test that can help with, with that. Um, there are some downsides to the test. So I wanna tell you about kind of the different outcomes of doing the test and, and find out what you think. And so if we took a thousand men in their 50s and 60s and followed them for about 15 years, I'll just jump to the end of this, which is that we would save, this number is a little old, we would save uh, around two people from dying from prostate cancer, which is actually pretty good. It's comparable to other cancer screenings and prevent a few more people from having widespread prostate cancer. So that's the benefit of the test is we'd find a few of these bad prostate cancers early and save your life from it. Um, the downside is, the funny thing about this, this test that we found is we end up finding a bunch of extra cancers. In other words, stuff that looks like a cancer to us under a microscope, but that if we hadn't gone looking for it with this PSA, you would have been fine and lived your regular life. Um, but because we did the PSA test, you end up with a, a cancer diagnosis that you wouldn't have otherwise needed. In other words, it didn't help you. And this probably happens to about 20 to 50 out of a thousand of the men. So in other words, for every thousand men that have this test, we save the life of two, uh, two or more men um, but we un inadvertently uh, create about 20 or 30 extra prostate cancer patients um, who um, then have to go through the discussion of whether or not to have treatment for it. And so um, those are the things we're weighing, you know, how does that strike you? And so, um, and this is something before the health decision, um, um, .org decision aid came out, I could just print this to people or I could send it, uh, send them a link to it through, through the portal. Um, I won't go through the the healthdecision.org decision A because it's basically the same conversation, but I'll just show it to you. And it basically shows that same information in pictorial format. And this one is updated with the most recent 16-year um, follow-up. So it shows two out of a thousand deaths prevented per thousand. And then it shows the number of cases of overdiagnosis there. So I think I'll mostly stop there. Let me go back to the PowerPoint and just say a couple more things and then I'll stop for questions. Um, so finding other decisions. So these are the ones I use very commonly in primary care and these are great, but there's plenty of other topics that you might wanna find an extra decision aid for. Um, Ottawa, the Ottawa Hospital has an entire research institute devoted to this. If you just Google patient decision aids, it's the first link that comes up. Um, the Mayo Clinic has an entire website devoted to this and they have a few other decision aids that I didn't go through. So if you Google Mayo decision aids, you can get to this page. Um, our own Raj Krishnamurthy and GI um, went, did a fellowship at Mayo and actually created a decision aid at Mayo on, on treating low-grade dysplasia uh, related to Barrett's esoph esophagus, which is, which is really cool. So I just want to give a shout out there. And so some take-home points that shared decision-making, I would argue, is the right thing to do. It doesn't have to take forever. In fact, using these tools, it can be um, relatively time efficient. Um, it's really important to be clear the decision is needed and that we, I want my patient to be the decider if they if they want to, and that part of our job is help patients think about what, they're, what they value and what they prefer, um, and um, that I would suggest considering using decision aids to improve the decision quality and the communication quality. Uh, so that's all I've got. I will take questions and stop Great. sharing. Thank you, Michael. I think, uh, I think everybody now understands my introductory uh, comments about how valuable this is. I think we have a couple of emailed in questions. Can uh, somebody read those to Michael? Okay, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, the first one is, how frequently are these tools updated? Is there an easy way for me to see how current they are? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, um, it's dependent on the tool. So the Mayo Clinic ones um, are seem to be updated less frequently. And so part of the way you can tell that is, you know, kind of how out of date the information is. I will say, though, when the Mayo Diabetes Aid was first created, it didn't include um, the SGLT2 inhibitors or the GLP-1 agonists, I believe. And so, or no, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it included those, but it didn't include the heart benefits of them. So they have added some things. For the health decision, Decision.org uh, decision aids, it's much easier because if you click on one of those little info buttons, it'll show you the, the, um, the article, you know, the, the journal article that they're basing those questions on. And so you can see kind of what they're using as the basis of their um, information. Okay, second question. This is actually a two-part question. Um, so here, here we go. The aids are helpful and simplify complex patient education and decision, decision making. Should EMRs have them built into the visit under problem list 
so that one click could bring into the discussion, then another button to include into final documentation. Oh God, I would love that. Um, so, I, you know, that, that's actually how the health, I'm, I'm not here as a, you know, representative of the health decision at RG, but that's actually how that was designed. It's designed to be integrated into the EHR. I think the, you know, the, there's an issue of cost, but I think, you know, how much time would it save if I didn't have to manually enter in data to get a, a cardiovascular risk score for all of my patients? So, you know, how much time has it saved for the radiology department to have um, included the fracture risk calculation in their DEXA reports. It's been an incredible time saver. So I, I totally agree that in an ideal world, this would be integrated in the EMR um, and, and, you know, and more easily accessible. Okay. And here's the second part of the, the question. How are these mathematical models verified with clinical studies? Yeah. And so, um, um, I, I didn't go through each, you know, each each of what the each of the uh, um, uh, the decision aids, but they're all, you know, they, you can click and find out kind of which which of you know the basis for each of those. For instance, the lung cancer screening information kind of came from the National Lung Screening Trial, the NLST. The breast cancer screening information came from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force update, in I think 2015 or 2018, I can't remember what year, but it, it will sh it shows you kind of um, what the source of the data is from each of those. The lipid one, I think, is from the cholesterol treatment uh, trial is collaborative, um, and so um, uh, it's it's they're it, they're generally drawn from well validated studies. I mean, part of the shared decision making is you can really only do shared decision making if you have well, I shouldn't say you should, you can only you can only be as specific as you can be. And so um, we have these numbers because there are studies to support this. There are going to be some of these decisions where we don't have numbers, and we still we do have to use just kind of general concepts rather than specific numbers because we might not always know the answer. And that is all the questions that I have, unless anyone else has any questions. I, I've got some that I can start with now. And if any more come in, let me know. Um, Michael, so the, the one of the issues with the cardiovascular risk calculators is the 10 years. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, we're the people we really want to convince that this might be helpful to them, or at least help them um, make that decision, um, are the 50-year-olds, 55-year-olds yeah. yeah. with an LDL cholesterol of 220. Um, and when you only go out 10 years, it's not as impressive, but if you go out there 30 years, and I saw the ACC uh, risk estimator did have a lifetime risk there, but it didn't adjust as you were adjusting some of the yep. issues. So how do you deal with that? How do you get the longer? Is there another one that you use? That yeah, so, so I actually, I, I, should have I should have left the slide and I actually took out a slide about this and I, my personal opinion and what I try to do is I think, you know, th there's a, a flat threshold of 7.5% tenure risk for all patients. And I really think that needs to be age adjusted. Like it's really difficult for a 50 year old to get a tenure risk greater than 7.5%. Whereas virtually every 63 year old Caucasian man has a risk that's 7.5% above, even if they have optimal risk factors. And so it doesn't really make any sense. There was actually a study that was more of a thought, a thought experiment that was published a few years ago in, Mer in the, uh, Journal of American College of Cardiology, which basically said, well, what if we adjusted those risk thresholds and that maybe for older individuals, the risk threshold should be more like 15 or 20 percent. And for young individuals, the risk threshold should be more like 5 percent. And would that improve our detection rate of people who actually end up getting heart attacks? And would that improve our overtreatment rate? And it turns out that if you lower the risk threshold for younger people and raise the risk threshold for older people, you do just that. You, you don't overtreat very many more people, but you capture a lot more the younger people that um, you, 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 you actually overtreat fewer older people and you undertreat more, uh, fewer young people, if that makes sense. And so the way I get around that is, yeah, the lifetime risk calculator doesn't really, isn't very sensitive. So I don't find that that lifetime risk calculator is very helpful. I almost always pull up the ASCVD tool that shows the optimal risk for that person's age and then shows them their risk. So that even somebody with a 3% risk, which isn't very high, um, that's pretty high if their optimal risk for their age is only 0.6%. I can say, gosh, your risk is five times as high or four times higher than ideal for your age. So even though it's not a huge number right now, um, gosh, what if you were 60 years old instead of being 45? And so I'll often change the age and say, gosh, look, this is what your risk would look like in the future. So we might want to deal with this now um, because, you know, even though your risk level isn't that high in the next 10 years, you know, between 60 and 70, it becomes pretty high. And so those are the two main techniques is to adjust the age and also compare it to the optimal risk score. Okay. I have one more if uh, there's no others. Um, you brought up the concepts of enumeracy, which I think is 
really vital. And then also overdiagnosis. And those are hard things for patients to understand. I think the pictographs really help. Um, and I, I, especially uh, some of the ones you showed, I haven't used real frequently. And, and uh, I was impressed with that. But are there any um, decision aids that just talk about those two topics that you can use, that you use to kind of go over the overdiagnosis topic a little bit more or the, the way numbers are manipulated by media and uh, marketing people to um, buy them in? Because obviously in numeracy is one of the big issues in society in a lot of different ways. Yeah, um, that's so, a great question, yeah. I can't think of any offhand. I will say like, for instance, the, the Cornell um, mammogram decision aid that I show you, you know, it does describe it in text kind of what's the concept of overdiagnosis? Why does, why does this happen? Um, most of the prostate cancer decision aids also kind of go over the concept of overdiagnosis. But I'll tell you, I've had this conversation about overdiagnosis, you know, hundreds or thousands of times. And I still don't know if I've found the most efficient way to communicate it. I think it's just a difficult concept for, for people to people to understand. And I try to use words like, gosh, we uh, un inadvertently or without meaning to, we create extra cancers or we find stuff that fools us into thinking you have this disease. I mean, and this, it doesn't just apply to cancer screening, right? We do overdiagnosis all the time with cardiovascular risk, as we just discussed. Like we tell people that they have a high cardiovascular risk, but they, you know, they go on and ne never have a heart attack in their life, for, even if, you know, and so there's plenty of people that we overdiagnose in that way. Um, and so I think the best thing we can do is just kind of show them what the numbers are, show them the likelihood and, and be clear that not everybody's going to be helped by, by what we do, um, that this, these are the number of people that will be helped. Okay, I think we're at time, so I don't see any. I see a couple of thank yous to you, Michael, uh, from our Zoom audience. Uh, uh, three of them, as a matter of fact, which is great. We appreciate your, your help today and your educating us and, and look forward to more. Great. Thank you so much for having <laughs> Thanks, me. I appreciate guys. it. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.